Welcome to the Retail Media Moguls podcast brought to you by Platform 195. We share trends and strategies across retail media to help you accelerate your brand growth. I'm your host, Stuart Adamson. Welcome to the Retail Media Moguls podcast. I'm your host, Stuart Adamson, founder and CEO of Platform 195. Today, we're honored to welcome Nielsen Hall, an expert in the expansive domain of e-commerce and retail media. As the present e-commerce head of EMEA at IPG Media Brands, Nielsen has solidified his reputation through myriad leadership roles, notably as the head of e-commerce and digital at Shop Direct, the UK's second largest online retailer, and the founder and former CEO of Illuminate. And with a career spanning senior agencies, startups, and client-side roles, he's been at the forefront of harnessing digital innovation for commercial success. Recognized by Media Week as one of its commendable number 30 in 2012, Nielsen's strategic acumen and unique vantage point have consistently steered brands towards remarkable digital transformations. Nielsen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Wow, what an intro. I hope I can uh, live up to that. But I, I have been following the podcast with interest and yeah, hopefully I can live up to some of the other speakers that you've had. So thank you for having me. I like the way you're still living off the 30 under 30 from 2012. <laughs> I know, you can say that was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I was senior e-commerce leader in something like 2014, so I might have to put that back Look, tell us a bit about that journey, actually. I mean, I'm really interested in the fact you're a CEO of your own startup and then obviously went to Shop Direct. How did you, what made you start that agency? What happened in that journey? That's really interesting. Oh, I've kind of come full circle, really. So I did my stint in, in an agency world and I, I absolutely loved it, but I recognized that there was a gap in the market, particularly when it came to display advertising, technology platforms and stacks and how that pertained to audience data. So I took, took the move to go off on my own, and I co-founded a business called Illuminate, but I was lucky enough to have investment from Tom Singh, who was the owner and founder of New Look. And I think that really sparked my interest in all things kind of retail. I really kind of did a lot for my knowledge when it came to understanding things like supply chains, you know, the requirements of different seasonal garments and things like that. And what we built was a performance marketing agency on one side of the business under the guise of of Illuminate. And that was supported by a technology platform and stack in the form of a DSP, which was called Geo. What we wanted to do with Geo was supply uh, digital advertising, display advertising that was more native. So particularly for big retail organizations that showed the clothing in a better way, had slight elements of movement to it. So it was really interesting kind of coming from the big kind of corporate world of, of agency and then really kind of going back to basics and starting your own your own company was squashed into the corner of a, of a shared office. But we grew that business you know, considerably over the course of three years. We had some fantastic brands we were working with. But that then the kind of the prospect of, of joining a client um, came to me and, and that was a really exciting opportunity. So I've had all my life in agency world. So when Shop Direct came knocking, of, of course, that was an opportunity that I couldn't turn down. So I made the trip up to Liverpool, which was a bit of a shock to the system for me, living down south all my life. And what did you do with the agency at that point? So that's still going strong. I sold my portion in, in the agency mm-hmm. and, and moved on. Still got kind of close ties with the agency and also the founders of, of the agency as well. So then, yeah, it was really to get that client side experience because I think you can kind of talk a lot about having an understanding of various niches and, and verticals, but it's not until you kind of step over the, the other side of the fence that you really do understand what that entails. So I was kind of thrown in, in a deep end at my time at Shop Direct, responsible for, for digital and in e-commerce, and that kind of covered all kind of performance marketing channels. And I think the big thing that, that struck me was the way that everything is far more integrated. So we had kind of trading meetings that we were talking about different kind of things like supply, logistics, when there was stock that we needed to get rid of, whether we were going to increase spend from a marketing perspective to, to, to sell products, or was that going to be done by brand and by promo via the, the, the trading teams? It was, it was already an interesting kind of dynamic. So if we had a stock that wasn't selling, the buyers would be like, not doing your digital marketing right. And the digital marketeers were like, no, you haven't bought the right product. But I think Shop Direct definitely in its class was one of the most advanced retailers probably globally, everything is done in a very sophisticated way, driven by algorithms. So for every single performance marketing channel, we would have KPIs, demand forecasted um, targets that we had to hit. And this was all done 
kind of algorithmically. So it, it was really kind of a, a plug and play solution, but, but also the, the amount of data that we had on our audiences and our customers were, were second to none. And that really kind of put us an advantage in, you know, what is an overly kind of complex and competitive landscape. I think the other thing that the shop direct have, they've done very well and they've kind of built on this, you know, subsequently is building up this persona of, of what Miss Very is like, you know, where she likes to reside, even down to the, the way that can, you know, travel into town. I remember one of the really kind of standout case studies that, that we did at Shop Direct was we were always tr- struggling to compete, obviously, with bricks and mortar retailers at peak times because we don't have the mental availability that they're able to get via signage or shop fronts, things like this. So one of the pieces of work that we did was we looked at our target customers. How do they get into town centers and cities for peak time? You know, what does that, their journey look like? Once we mapped what the most common kind of route into town was, we were able then to kind of put up very digital out of home signage leading all the way into town for our better offers on PlayStations, for example, that would undercut those on the high streets, really powerful kind of media activations that really kind of broached on and, and utilized our, our understanding of data. And also, I think more and more what we were trying to do was trying to make very become a destination more than anything else. So with a lot of the, the finance options that, that are available, looking at how we can make the very customers' lives easier. I think from a marketing perspective, you know, when I was there, it wasn't always the easiest deliver on because um, some products better that we sold those products from the finance perspective as opposed to just selling them outright. And I think that alone came with its own challenges. But I love working for Barry, a fantastic company, and I, I learned a lot. And I kind of went full circle and moved back to London when the opportunity arose to join IPG. And they just formed the commerce division. I think I was employee number two and really had a blank sheet of paper to really start to evangelize commerce within IPG, but also for our clients. I think the really interesting thing for me was that all our clients came with different, very diverse challenges within the retail space. Um, I think on my second day here, I came into the office and, and then we were all locked down. So we're all kind of swiftly put home. So I must admit, I didn't meet very many colleagues for the first few months at, at least, but the challenges we had ranged from you know, FMCG clients that, that were over relied on bricks and mortar sales, asking us about, you know, how could they restructure their organization to better facilitate retail media and commerce as, as a whole. We had larger clients that have been doing retail media for many years, finally discovering the concept of clean rooms. And how can they basically amalgamate all of their data into a central point and use it more tactically for, for digital marketing? And then more and more clients, although they didn't sell specifically on retail media networks, so non-endemic brands, they were going, actually, (laughs) there's a lot of data that's here and also a big opportunity for us to to expose ourselves further, um, given the fact that that Google and and Meta cost per clicks were spiraling out of control, competition was becoming increasingly hard to to cut through. So I think the challenges that we got were, were all different. The last kind of three years have flown by. I think now these challenges have started to change as well. So a lot of our clients now are looking for ever more kind of complex and intricate ways in which they can better engage with, with their customer. And I think we've, we've moved from a world from 99 up until now where a lot of what we were doing was algorithmically driven. And I think going forward from now onwards, it's going to be more intelligence driven, which I think is a really significant shift. And with that shift, we have all of the opportunities that the audiences and, and clean rooms offer to us. Tell us a bit about that difference. What is the difference there between the algorithm and that intelligence? If, if I was a client asking you, so what, one word AI. We can't ignore the, the impact of you know, performance marketing and what Google's doing with performance max and advertising opportunities that, that we have available to us on Meta, which is largely around reach. We had teams that we could look at things like the the ad copy, you know, positioning, but largely it's a plug and play solution. And you can enter your keywords, you've got your budgets and, it, and it's largely done for you. And I think kind of AI is definitely putting a bit more complexity into the marketplace, but also a number of opportunities. You know, it, it's a great leveler when it comes to things like kind of content creation, 
having a certain product image that you could put in lo- multiple different locations or multiple different kind of people. Um, but also the, the fact that how you use all of this audience data via clean rooms is becoming ever more important. So having a better understanding about where your target audience reside, but also if you think you've got not just your advertising or Meta and Google, but you've got all these different e-rate retailers and they're all the data is coming back from them in different formats, in different forms, often not comparable. It is how you can kind of distill that down and make some use of it via a, via a clean room solution. So we're going to come back to the, to the data and the clean room thing because it's, it's really exciting. It's, it's great to see it from an agency point of view is where those developments are going. But let's go up a level to the, to the European thing. So obviously you, you manage e-commerce clients across EMEA. Which markets are doing well? Where are you seeing people really sort of doing the right things? Which markets are forefront of retail media, do you think? I'm always very jealous and envious, if I'm honest, of our, some of our colleagues over in the States where what's happening is brilliant, but I, I definitely think it's a very simple model compared to what we have over in EMEA because you have five or six main players. Largely, they're, they're pretty mature in the way they're activating kind of retail media. But when you come to EMEA, we're incredibly fragmented, first and foremost. So we have lots of different e-retailers, all at different stages of, of their maturity, all finding out and understanding how best that they can offer both their customers and potentially brands an opportunity to better kind of have a better relationship or to a better word. And then I think the markets themselves are, are at different levels of maturity and the audiences that you have within those markets are also very different. So to get consistency is the biggest challenge that we have as an agency. I think we're making big strides into that via our kind of unified retail media platform. We're looking about breaking down all of the disparaging data sets that we get, putting it into one consolidated format that we use you know, across multiple, multiple different e-retailers. I think some of the things that are happening from a strategic point of view really lend themselves to, to some of the working groups and the councils that are, that are happening. I think the UK is, is largely driving that forward, but, but then there's some really interesting things going on in the likes of Germany, Spain, France, you know, some of the bigger markets, you know, you have to see what the likes of Carrefour are doing. But I think it is very much a bit of an arms race at the moment. There's a lot of competition, a lot of negotiations happening when it comes to kind of partnerships between kind of retailers and e- agencies and also kind of technology providers as well. Nice high quality problem to have really, isn't it? So. That's brilliant. So tell me about, I want to go back a little bit, if that's okay. I want to talk about Shop Direct and just touch on it before, but for our listeners, that's Littlewoods and Very in terms of retailers. I remember actually while I was a few years ago, Very being quite a mature media business. Tell us a bit about what their, across Littlewoods and Very, what their sort of media offering was. Yeah, they got on quite the journey to, to say the least. So you know, Littlewoods started off at, as a catalogue manufacturer or business many, many moons ago. It was one of the biggest in the UK. And I think they were very quick to realize that there was only a finite amount of time that a catalog business would survive in this digital economy that we're creating. So there was a big play to try and digitally transform the, the business as quickly and as effectively as possible. So you seeing little words as essentially being a business in a managed decline, whereas you had very kind of the online business with not so many of the, the overhead, with a lot more of the opportunities and the potential audiences to gain from. So one of the, the things that, that Very did very successfully was use technology and data. So it had the biggest data science team in the UK at the time. So, you know, over 110 people just looking at every slight kind of tweak and optimization that, that was possible in order to get cut through in what was a very kind of competitive landscape. They also were very quick to adopt what was then new techniques when it came to things like UX. So they, I remember one day going in and all of a sudden there was a new UX room that had been built and they would get various different audiences and very closely watch what their interactions were like on the website and then implement those changes as swiftly as possible. And that was kind of really kind of turbocharged by the fact that the performance marketing team were very kind of diligent when it came to their optimizations, but their optimizations were based on that data of the output of the data and science team. So whether it was paid search or paid social display, all had very, very specific kind of targets. And also it's that kind of, you know, creating that culture of curiosity. You know, it was a fantastic kind of environment to be in, in the sky, skyways, everyone was in, 
in one place. And it was always encouraged to kind of challenge the norms and come up with new ways that we can kind of build and, and bring the brand on. I think one of which is certainly a passion point of mine at the moment is own media network. So I think there is was the first time that kind of I came ar- across this concept of brands not just using retailers to try and sell their products, but also looking a bit closer to home. What can they do to further kind of promote and generate revenue from their own kind of sphere and, and collateral? And very one of the first brands to do that. So partnering with, with a technology company, they were able to actually monetize all of their kind of on-site assets. So for example, if you go onto the laptop, product landing page, you know, you'll see at the top that you have some featured products or some selected products, or you have the opportunity to drop down and select a certain brand. Those brands basically were in an auction model. So whether you were uh, Lenovo or, or Sony, you were able to bid to ensure your brand could appear higher on those product pages. That was a first. So the ability to give those brands that opportunity was, was significant. I think it's also kind of it introduces another element of uncertainty for brands in so much that we've almost got this endless shopping aisle now where users have so many opportunities to select products. So it does make kind of the competitive nature of what those brands can do on own media networks a bit more challenging. But I think a lot of what I'm doing now at IPG is exploring this further for, for other brands. So not just retailers, but maybe kind of non-endemic brands that have, you know, lots of collateral at their disposal that they're able to monetize. You know, I think one of the big benefits of this that we tell to clients is not just about the revenue that you could potentially generate, although that is kind of significant. It's also about with the onset of the cookie no longer going to be with us, you're going to be able to get a lot of that data that you know you're no longer privy to. So for example, you're going to be able to get frequency metrics, which are going to be credible, useful to you. You're going to be able to get a better understanding of your audience and what they're doing and what other websites they're engaging with. I think this kind of concept of building up your own media network is going to become increasingly important as the years go on. Yeah, it's interesting that piece around because obviously retail media, it's kind of been there forever really. It's just been highlighted now and it's moved online and some stuff. But what's interesting is that brand media piece. And I remember when we first started Platform 195, we did a piece of work for a, actually for a restaurant chain that you know, they said, oh, we want a retail media network. Well, you're not really a retailer. And then actually we looked at it and realized they had huge scale in terms of audience, international presence. And like, actually, you've got something here. And actually you're going back to more sort of on-site advertising as a, rather than it being retail media, per se, it, it, almost brand media. So that's really interesting in that, that you've got brands doing that. Are you seeing the shift in talent and how your teams are working with retailers in order to harness the retail media piece? How's that evolving? Absolutely. And I think it was a real change in the type of people that, that we got into to the business. I think based on a lot of the, lot of the kind of the questions and, and the challenges of projects that were getting posed by clients, I wanted to kind of reset the, the type of individuals that we get into the organization. So not typical kind of planner or performance marketeer, but someone that had experience, you know, being client side working in the coalface of an FMCG organization, for example, because I think a lot of the challenges that they had being agency side and being, sorry, client side were what we were getting asked as an agency. So I think that really, really helped. And it also allowed us to, as an agency, kind of explore different kind of departments and understand better what those particular clients were, were doing in other areas we didn't have sight into. Very much back to the time where I kind of went into uh, Shop Direct expecting to see this an organization with very kind of binary, but all of a sudden realizing that it had so many different kind of facets to it. And I think, you know, when we're looking at retail media, you can't ignore really important points like stock, availability and distribution. And now we're talking to clients about SKU level profitability as opposed to this is your media and this is how much you spent. So and having getting that SKU kind of profitability data is about how long can I keep it in the warehouse for? What's the cost of delivery? How much does it weigh? And what does any changes to the kind of the manufacturing have an impact on that product being distributed? So lots more that we need to take on board, but there's more opportunities for for refinement, kind of almost micro optimizations across the course of manufacture to to ultimately that product being sold. 
So how that talk us about because we took we've touched on the clean room thing and obviously we know the cookies are, are going. What are you seeing? What's the evolution of the technology that's happening in there at the moment? So I think the interesting thing is there's no kind of one size kind of fit, fits all kind of solution to this. I think from a clean room perspective, AWS seems to be kind of the forefront of, of possibilities, and the vast majority of our clients are using that. We also have some clients using kind of Snowflake as their kind of preferred clean room kind of technology solution. But the clean rooms are only as good as the data that you're getting from your clients. And it's like kind of when you go back to AI, you need to have that kind of information there. And then once you've got that in a format, digestible and actionable, then you can start doing some really cool kind of cross-platform optimizations. But I think what we're focusing on a lot, particularly from an EMEA perspective, is trying to lead the way when it comes to standardization of data that's coming back to us from third parties like Nectar, like Dan Humby. I think once you have that standardization, then you can start doing some really interesting things. So, for example, you know, in the FMCG space, if you have a Tesco's and a Sainsbury's and you're having that data being put into a clean room, you can find that actually we're, we're able to sell products, you know, cheaper, for example, and, and more effectively by a Sainsbury's at the moment, maybe because there's a better affinity to our audience. Therefore, we could automatically in real time put more spend towards that particular retailer. And that's just an example, but I think that real time optimization is going to be, you know, really important kind of going forward in the fast paced world of, of commerce that we live. So how much of that business, for example, if we're taking it from a brand point of view and you're deciding where to put that spend, that's now largely being found because often those just they step back is often those brands are have that direct relationship with the retailer because, you know, they know the buying teams and they know the marketing teams and they've always had that relationship. They understand retail. Are you seeing that actually that spends now coming to you or has it always come to you? I'm not that familiar with the FMCG bees. It's a really good kind of question and it does vary by retailer, but there are a number of different things I think in the last couple of years that have, we've stumbled upon the, the kind of big, quite significant changes. I think first and foremost is a lot of the brands and the retailers have kind of existing JBPs in, in place. So they will have almost spend commitments or commitments when it comes to product placements. These are largely born out of what the bricks and mortar uh, store, a precedent that has been set by the bricks and mortar store. So we spend a lot of time working through these JBPs with our clients, making sure that they're taking into consideration retail media, that we're not kind of hamstrung in many places. And also there's a fluid movement of budget. If the in-store isn't working for whatever reason, we can quickly and easily transfer that over to retail media so we're not kind of losing out. I think definitely and the teams themselves, which we've kind of touched on before, being very separate. It's a lot of kind of education, I think, on, on both sides, but that typically happens at the beginning of our, our kind of client engagement. And then also when it comes to scoping, because you know, retail media, it's not as easy as you know your typical kind of media buy. There's far more kind of facets to it, not least of creative assets and things like that, but it's also about understanding the skew. You optimize in a different way and you need to make sure that all of your, your DSP and your search activity are complemented by a really kind of solid organic presence. And again, in EMEA, one of the things we have a number of different kind of algorithms underpinning a lot of the different retailers. They work very differently. You know, some are even quite biased towards their own products. So one of the things that how our, our kind of organic search team has evolved is now they don't just optimize for, for Google, but they have the ability to optimize for different marketplaces and different e-retailers. And it, what we've tried to do is document via a series of tests what optimizations work best on different e-retailers. So, for example, the flywheel on Amazon, we know that it's not, it's not just keywords, but it's having kind of product dimensions and sizes in the title tag will, will kind of give you a greater organic visibility, whereas some of our other retailers in in the UK, for example, by a certain attribute being assigned to their description and, and certain imagery kind of being produced as part of that product landing page. So you've got to get kind of the paid and, and the organic kind of working together in order to get that that kind of holistic view with, with the, the optimum amount of cut through. So I think let's talk a bit about that clean room piece then. Uh, you know, I'm really fascinated by the fact that you can suddenly start to see across multiple retailers and how that's influencing the buying. Are the clients really accepting of this? Are they frustrated that they, you're not there yet 
in terms of I not because of you, but because of the retailers, are they demanding in it or are they still look and see? So there's two sides to this. I think like on the face of it, the biggest clients we work with are like this could be game changing. They, they see the, the clear benefits of it, but it all comes down to data security. This is the biggest kind of hurdle we, we come across because fundamentally they have to release their data into a third party's clean room. And that comes with complications. And I think it's still kind of very nascent. At the beginning of possibilities. I think a lot of bigger organizations are having trouble with this component, keeping an eye on where it goes, how it's being used to make sure that obviously you're following all kind of the various different compliance legislation and issues you have. I think smaller, more agile, online pure play brands, they haven't got as much to risk, I suppose. So they're using it in a clever way, quite agilely as well. I think the starting point has to be with Amazon because you do have that security with Amazon. You've got number of different years of advertising on Amazon, you're familiar with the, the organization, the infrastructure and the tech setup. And I think that's going to be the first kind of foray or, or route to market. And when people are comfortable with that and they have the, the security that they need around their data, I think then kind of clean rooms and this concept of clean rooms is only going to come more prevalent. We'll get there, but it, it is going to take time. So I think we've, we're probably sort of getting towards the end of time now, which is annoying because I think we could sit here all day. But I, I think sort of last final question i think obviously you've got that view and it'll be a long answer don't worry but it's really looking ahead how do you see this future landscape of retail media networks evolving over say the next five to ten years what are we going to see about my first kind of point being a little bit cliche i don't think we can ignore the implications of ai as i said moving from this world of algorithmic advertising and, and planning into, into a way where intelligence is going to become ever more kind of prevalent. I think that's kind of first and foremost. I think the impact and play of big market like places like Amazon is not going to go away. I think if you talk to me about Amazon five years ago, it used to be the ultimate kind of conversion engine, you know, getting customers in and out as quickly as and efficiently as possible. But I think, I think now, much like a number of other marketplaces, it's becoming a destination in its own right. It's got all endless shopping aisles, virtual shopping aisles. It's got fantastic rich media, ever more opportunities for clients to engage with their clients via the platform, whether you're endemic or non-endemic now, but also the fact that it connected to things like voice or connected television means you've almost got a whole ecosystem that you can explore. And at the end of it, you're going to get that really valuable kind of middle data that is often missing that by data. And I think finally, the the importance of owned media or owned retail media ecosystem. So looking at the collateral you've got, looking at all of the assets you've got, not only just how can you better monetize them, which there's obviously good implications of, we've seen from all of the different retailers within EMEA, but, but also how can you use that data to fill some of the voids that are going to come apparent with the loss of cookie. So looking at better frequency, a better understanding of a customer journey. So you can start kind of modeling out what those audience look like with, with, without having the need for, for cookie data. So that'd be my top three. I think I could go on for a long time, but I think I'll... Uh... And I know I said that was the last question, but as a result of that, I've got a couple more. So one is just around that sort of media bit, which is interesting to see how that will evolve, definitely, certainly around the customer journey. And probably not a question, actually, it's more of a a comment, but the opportunity there is we will always try to manage that sequential targeting. So what, how does that message evolve from inspiration through to performance? Certainly when you're looking at connected TV at the top, for example, all the way down to on-site ad, if you brought somebody back. But interesting though, really interesting. We, we were talking about the virtual aisles and the shopping and the, and the fact that Amazon has traditionally tried to get people from through the site as fast as possible. Actually, is there, given that there's an opportunity to be creative and there's a that virtual aisle thing, is there actually a, a method, is there an opportunity in there to effectively keep people on site longer because you're making more money from the eyeballs and the creative activity that's going on on site? Are we seeing that? I think in a world where, you know, kind of time on site awareness is the currency, I definitely think that's an important play. And the longer you're having a potential customer on your own asset, the more you're learning about them. And I think to, to your kind of final point you just made earlier, a really good way in which you could use that is by personalization. So, you know, when you're trying to kind of get person 
from A to B, you know, in a more traditional way. It can be a little bit clunky and there can be these kind of wall gardens where you've got gaps in, in the data and maybe the experience they're having is not as, not as kind of as good as it could be. But I think when you're getting more data and you can personalize that journey a little bit more, I think that's when it becomes really interesting. Yeah, you know, I was working with an FMCG client the other day. An example of how you could use with that clean room data on, on a various like, retailer, we knew that this potential customer was lover of chocolate, always had chocolate in their basket. But for the last two weeks, they hadn't been purchasing this chocolate bar of note that we were trying to promote. And therefore, using that kind of information and data, that's when you could personalize the journey to, in certain points, kind of push them towards the, the brand that we're, we're trying to kind of promote. So, yeah, really, really interesting and exciting area. I'd be amazed to see that touch point thing. It's actually because from a media point of view, you kind of want as many touch points as possible because there's an opportunity to monetize each. But also the end game is obviously to try and sell a product for your partner. It's interesting how that will evolve, especially as creativity does and touch points such as sort of, you know, connected TV and digital out home and, and all these then blend with performance and on-site, all the way down to on-site sort of sponsored listings or retail to shop around. And listen, Nielsen, it's been absolutely fascinating. I'd love you to come back if you can in a few months' time and come and talk to us about how it's evolved. It's been really good. Thanks for having me. I've really enjoyed it. The Retail Media Moguls podcast is brought to you by Platform 195. To learn more about Platform 195 and how to connect retail media with intelligent marketing to accelerate growth, visit platform195.com. And then make sure to search for Retail Media Moguls in Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts or anywhere else podcasts are found. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. And on behalf of the team here at Platform 195, thanks for listening. Thank you.